out of here today with a stack of energy, enthusiasm and excitement for the rest of the year, would that be a good thing? Yeah. I call it the three E's, energy, enthusiasm and excitement. If I could inject you with some of that today and it lasted for the rest of the year and beyond, would that be good? Yeah. Yeah. And some of you are looking at me really sceptically, like who is this ridiculous woman <laughs> and what is going on? Uh, I will give you a little bit of background. I, I'm here because I've given up on adults. <laughs> I, I have been an exercise professional all of my life and this is how it started. I, I was overweight, I had buck teeth and I'm from Australia obviously, I could put a 20 cent coin, an Australian 20 cent coin between my two front teeth. I had pimples on my face and I was bullied at school because I was a fat, ugly kid. The reason I'm sharing with you that I was bullied is I don't, I'm not sure it gets any worse than this. I'm pretty old. And at my school, a message went around my school that, uh, and it was this simple, and it was pre-social uh, media. Was a piece of paper and the two most popular girls in the school sent this piece of paper around the school that said if you like Rowie tick yes and if you don't like Rowie tick no. So at the end of the day I've got this pile of paper, private boarding school 450 people and the two girls that did the survey they were the most popular girls, best looking girls, all the blokes wanted to be their boyfriend and all the girls wanted to be like them so they were pretty popular. So when those girls come up to you with a piece of paper and say, tick no if you don't like Rowie, everybody tick no. So I had 450 pieces of paper that said we don't like Rowie. I went home, uh, <laughs> closed the bedroom door and burst into tears, wouldn't you? But what I did know is that really passionate, positive, powerful people who really like who they are, they don't pick on weak people. Only weak people pick on weak people. I was street smart enough to know that. I was only 13 years old. So I figured that those two popular girls must have had some challenges in their life to pick on me. So I want to share with you the reason I can walk into a room of people that I don't know and be passionate and positive and obviously don't care whether you like me or not. I don't care. <laughs> this is what happened. I looked at myself in the mirror in my own bedroom that day, buck teeth, pimples on my face, overweight. I looked at myself in the eye and I said, from this day forward, I'm going to be a powerful, passionate, positive person. Say it with me, just get in the, in the mood with me. From this day forward, I will be a powerful, passionate, positive person. Boom. Slammed my foot. And I did that because I figured that nobody can hurt me, nobody can offend me, nobody can make me angry unless I allow them to. Would that be fair? And I decided that from that day forward, I was not going to let anybody do that to me ever again. So I walked back into school the next day. <laughs> I don't think the girls expected me to come back to school the next day. But when I left the school the day before, I walked out like this, you can imagine. And I'm asking you just to take note of that in particular because can people pick up on how we feel simply by the way we stand? Yeah? If you've got poor posture and you've got a grumpy look on your face, no one's going to think that you're a powerful, passionate, positive person. <laughs> but that's how I walked out of the school. When I walked back in the next day, I walked straight up to the girls, both of them, looked them in the eye and said, thank you very much. Because of you, I am now a powerful, passionate, positive person. Boom. Now I'm sharing that with you because I decided that at 13. And we're all adults in this room. Do we get to decide what kind of person we want to be? And you can tell me how many times, you can tell me a thousand times that people are trying to hurt you, upset you, pull you down, say nasty things about you, criticise you, all of that. But nobody can do that to you unless you allow them to. Would that be fair? That day changed my life. But about two weeks later, 
these two people walked into my school. It was a, I call it free water coming out of the sky. Some people call it rain. <laughs> but at my school, it was free water coming out of the sky because I'm a powerful, passionate, positive person now, I remember. And we couldn't do outdoor sport. And at my school, it was a really big deal to be good at sport. And I wasn't. I was the one that wanted to avoid sport because I was a chubby one, yeah? So we all came into a room about this big, 450 people. And I don't know, I'm looking around at ages now because you probably have to be as old as me to get this. But these two people walked into the room and they were dressed in lycra full-length leotards. The guy was wearing a black one with red flop socks and a red headband. And the girl was wearing a red one with black, uh, uh, the opposite. And back then it was Reebok shoes. They were the real in shoes. And I went to a private boarding school where you couldn't listen to rock music and you couldn't dance. And these people came into this big room like this, put music on a cassette player, if you can remember what that is. <laughs> and we started doing this to music. It was called Jane Fonda's Aerobics. Does anybody remember? Sadly. <laughs> now, I had, I had been wanting to exercise, and since the age of 10, I had a brother who had a girlfriend who very proudly said to me when I was 10, you're fat. And I was, and I started exercising. But from 10 to 13, I was exercising on the floor. You know, these ones, and these ones, and these ones. And nothing happens when you don't, when you do little exercises, you don't get any results. So for three years, I've been exercising with no result. All of a sudden, I was up off the floor, listening to music that I wasn't supposed to listen to because at my school it was against the law. And we were moving and I was getting puffed. And I felt fantastic. Went home to my father who sent me to private boarding school to become a lawyer. And I said, Dad, I'm going to be an exercise instructor. <laughs> you have to do it with a smile on your face. <laughs> My father could speak seven languages fluently. He swore at me in all seven. <laughs> Said, no, over my dead body, you're going to be a lawyer, not an exercise instructor. To his, or in his defence, it wasn't really a career path. There wasn't one. But I knew, and I'm sure like everybody else in this room, that if you're doing what you're doing because it's the thing that you're the most passionate about, no one could take it away from you. If you're doing what you're doing because you love it and you want to make a difference in the world, it doesn't matter what anybody ever says to you and it doesn't matter how bad the day is or how awful the parents are or how bad the kids are or it doesn't matter what happens, because you love it, you want to keep doing it. Well, I had a father that didn't think it was a real job. My family said it was stupid. My school said it was stupid. I can't tell you. I'm just going to tell you what happened. I ran away from home. 14 and 9 months and became an aerobic instructor because <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. And the reason I'm here today is I wanted every single little girl in the world to feel like I did that day, that first day where I felt, and it's just called a chemical response called endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. It just felt fantastic. My brain filled up with happy drugs. So my life since then, since 13 years of age, has been how do I get the world healthy fit and strong? And to explain my comment before, the reason I've given up on adults is adults can do whatever they want. <laughs> Smoke, drink, take drugs, not exercise, eat crappy food. Adults get to choose all of that, yes or no? But our kids, I think they deserve better than that, don't you? And I'm an Australian who's been living in New Zealand for the last 14 years for this reason. I was in my office in Australia and I saw the statistics from the Ministry of Health in New Zealand on the health of New Zealanders. One in three children in New Zealand have one of the five big killers, or all of them, the precursors to coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, Osteoporosis is supposed to be an old women's disease. Did you know that? We've got kids now with osteoporosis. I hope that scares the hell out of you. 
We've got kids with their neck of femur wasting away because they sit down all the time and they're not active. I think that's wrong, don't you? And that's why I'm here today, because I think what you do, you have the biggest influence over the future of our world. So I want to give you today the quickest, easiest way to get healthy, fit, strong and stay away for the rest of your life. And I hope that you can inspire our kids to do the same, because that sounds good. So my total inspiration for my entire life since the age of 13 has been how do I get healthy, fit and strong and how do I inspire the rest of the world to be healthy, fit and strong? Ha ha! Now one of the things that I find fascinating is normally people who are healthy, fit and strong are either fanatical lunatics or they have grumpy looks on their faces. Have you ever been to a fun run? It's called a fun run. Have you seen people's faces at a fun run? I've been to support people at fun runs and I wave and clap and cheer for them and it's... <laughs> I used to live on the Gold Coast. The sun is shining, the water's aqua blue, the sand is white and I'm, I'm walking on the beach smiling at people and people doing this. Leave me alone, I'm burning calories. I've got to burn fat, I've got to do 10,000 steps, don't talk to me. It's not meant to be like that, is it? <laughs> If I talk about energy, enthusiasm and excitement, wouldn't it be good if we could energise and excite with enthusiasm our children to be healthy, fit and strong for the rest of their lives? Would that be good? Yes. So not only am I here to inspire you to do that, but it's the message is in a song. It's only got five verses and hardly any words. Does that sound good? <laughs> so if we learn that song today, you could take that to your kids. Would that be good? Please. <laughs> And my driving force for this, and I'm going to give you the two big reasons. My father died of Alzheimer's. My father died pre-1999. If you've done any um, brain science, any brain study. Up until 1999, the world believed that you couldn't regrow brain cells. There was no such thing as neurogenesis. So when my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, the neurosurgeon said, that's it, he's going to die. A man who could speak seven languages fluently, he knew the Bible verbatim, he could play musical instruments and he could sing multiple musical instruments and he learned the words to songs. And they put him in a, ho a hotel room, I'm in a hotel. They put him in a hospital room and closed the door pretty much. Of course he went crazy really fast. When I said to the neurosurgeon, what can we do about this? The answer was nothing. That's just what happens when you get old. Well, I've got some swear words for that. <laughs> I don't want to get old, how about you? Guess what we now know? There is such a thing as neurogenesis. The brain can grow new brain cells and you can force your brain to stay young. Does that sound good? So from that day forward, because I said to the neurosurgeon very uh, arrogantly, can you imagine, I think I was 18, to talk to a neurosurgeon like this. We can regrow every other cell in our body. Why can't we regrow brain cells? He looked at me like I was a stupid blonde and said, because we just can't. And I wasn't happy with that answer. I'm just going to digress a tad. I got suspended from school several times, private religious boarding school, because I used to ask questions like that all the time. A small girl asking questions, logical questions that nobody can give me an answer to. And it was interesting in a religious school because the answer was always this, just have faith, Rowie. I said, that's great, but I want an answer. Get to the office was always the answer. I got suspended for listening to Elton John at my school because he was the devil. <laughs> I'm sharing that with you because don't we want to teach our kids to be critical thinkers? Don't we? I have an education college. I want my students to think for themselves. I don't want to tell them what to think. How about you? Well, to have a critical thinking brain, you also have to have a healthy brain. So that's been a big driving force for me. How do we make sure that our kids have got really healthy brains that are open to learning? Does that sound important? Well, I'm going to get everybody standing up very quickly for a very important reason. Please stand up. Just as, again, it's an interesting side note. Have you ever felt stressed, angry, annoyed, frustrated in your life ever? <laughs> Would you like a quick tip on how to get rid of that really fast? Yes. We're going to do a triathlon. Does that sound good? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is the ultimate triathlon and I hope you 
use it every single day for the rest of your life. It's really good fun. So the first one is, have you heard of the fight and flight system in the body? When you're under stress, your body goes into fight and flight. I want to turn and fight the threat or I want to run away from it, yes? So we're going to fight it first. All I want you to do is get fighting stance, one foot in front of the other, and we're going to punch because the fight and flight system, the phosphate system is 10 seconds. So we're going to punch as hard as you can, just 10 seconds. Are you ready? Go. 10, 9, 8, 7, go. 6, harder. 5, 4, 3, harder. Harder, harder. 2, 1. Easy, first round of the triathlon. What is it? 10 seconds of fighting, yes? Now we've got to flight in. Because <laughs> sometimes you can't fight, you've got to run away. You've got to get yourself out of there, yeah? So even if you've got high heel shoes on like I have, keep your feet close to the ground and I want you to sprint away from the wild animal for 10 seconds. Go. 10, 9, go. 8, 7, 6, 5, harder. 4, go faster. 3, hold your babies if you have to. 2, 1, Beautiful. Fight, flight. Have you ever felt like negativity has stuck to you? You've shared, and I, this is just a simple example. How are you today? Have you ever said that to somebody and they've gone, well, <laughs> I'm tired, I'm stressed, I've got a sore foot, I didn't get any sleep last night, I've got a headache, I'm really hungry. And they tell you. <laughs> Well, after you have to experience that, first of all, don't ever ask people how they are. Just say, super duper doo, how are you? I'm sure you are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever have to deal with negativity, the third part of the triathlon is shake off negativity. You ready? Go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ha, ha, go. <laughs> so you just had a stressful conversation with somebody, a parent, a child. <laughs> and you feel the stress coming on, the triathlon is 10 seconds of fighting, 10 seconds of flighting, 10 seconds of shaking off negativity. We'll do it all together at once. You ready? Set, go. 10, 9, 8, 7, harder, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, harder, 5, 4, 3, 2, shake it off, baby. you know about your anatomy, physiology and biology, 
the waste product of the lactate system is lactic acid. I'm going to say that again. Lactic acid. It makes you feel sick and it makes your muscles burn. Have you heard the silly exercise instructor say that? Feel the burn. <laughs> Whenever you hear people say that, it means you're in the lactate system. So you've got lactic acid pushing up against nerve endings causing a burning sensation. It's not exploding fat cells. It's just a burning sensation. Why, as an exercise professional, would I want to make somebody feel sick and have burning muscles when they're not even working at 100% effort? In the phosphate system, the fight and flight system to get away from the threat, we all, we all heard it, we did that in biology in school, didn't we, the fight and flight system? Yeah? 10 seconds of intense activity at 100% effort. Now here's what happens. This is why I get so excited. I produce epinephrine, adrenaline, and cortisol, which is the chemicals I need to get away from the wild animal from the threat, yes? My body produces those automatically. After I have got away from the threat, after I've killed the animal or I've sprinted away from it, now my brain says, row you bloody legend. <laughs> <laughs> Dopamine rush. It's a neurotransmitter to reward you for overcoming a, a, a threat, yes? People are addicted to dopamine for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> but the ultimate addiction to dopamine comes from getting away from the threat. Serotonin. In New Zealand today, the number one drug dispensed is serotonin, change your brain chemicals, antidepressants. When you get away from a threat, when you overcome a challenge, your serotonin levels level, level out and you feel satisfied. It's called the satisfaction neurotransmitter. So you feel rewarded woo and satisfied with your life. So even if everything around you is shit, you still feel good because your serotonin levels are right. Is that exciting? Come on. <laughs> Endorphins, you've heard that, the, the runner's high. The ultimate painkiller is an endorphin. It's as powerful as uh, We'll use cannabis because that's a popular topic in New Zealand. People are taking cannabis for painkilling, yes. When you produce endorphins, you also produce cannabinoids, which is the same feeling that you get from cannabis. That comes from overcoming a threat, overcoming a challenge, rewarding yourself. Come on, this is exciting. You get addicted and high from 10 seconds of high intense activity. The really big one though, which I wish I'd learned this in school and I hope you teach your kids this amazing expression. BDNF, brain derived neurotropic factor. Makes me sound important, doesn't it? Fertilizer for your brain. When you sprint, and this is just basic physiology, when you sprint and you get away from something that's threatening you, or you turn and kill something that's trying to kill you, your brain automatically says, if that ever happens to you again, you better be better. What if the animal's bigger? What if the tribe has more people in it? What if the threat is bigger? We have to make you smarter, stronger, wiser, better for next time. Make sense? So your body fills your brain, your, your endocrine system fills your brain with brain-derived neurotropic factor to make you smarter for next time. I've got goosebumps telling you about this. <laughs> Because guess what else brain drive neurotropic factor produces? Neuroplasticity, which is the ability to think differently next time. Neurogenesis. New brain cells. If you've got shitty, horrible, terrible thoughts, you can drop them off, get rid of the horrible old brain cells, and grow new ones. Is that exciting? Yeah. Now that doesn't happen in the lactate system where you get a burning sensation and feel sick. And it doesn't happen in the aerobic system, which is what we're doing now. Breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide, and that's how we live all day long. We can walk for hours. Nothing changes. The only way your brain changes is when you force it to. And the only way to force it to is to put it under threat and put it under pressure. So who's got a diamond on their body somewhere right now? Engagement ring, wedding ring, some kind of diamond. I've got my beautiful husband's here for... Uh, fifth Dan martial artist. 
He's a lethal weapon. <laughs> but also a beautiful husband who buys me diamonds. Now, people think that's a lovely thing to do, but the beautiful reason that I have diamonds is how were diamonds created? What were they before they were diamonds? Dirty old rocks. <laughs> they were just dirty old rocks until the earth put them under pressure. And the more pressure, the more beautiful the diamond, the more clarity in the diamond, the more expensive the diamond. So if you're wearing a diamond right now, just touch it. And if you're ever under threat, you feel under pressure, say to yourself, diamonds are created under pressure. I'm a bloody diamond. <laughs> well, I'm going to get stronger and tougher today because the more pressure, the more beautiful I'm going to become. Doesn't that feel good automatically? Well, we don't get chased by wild animals anymore, probably. <laughs> Mind you, I've just been at St. Bathurst a couple of weeks ago. There's a guy called Steve who, who has a beautiful home in St. Bathurst and he was attacked by a wild pig. Knocked him out, dislocated his shoulder. And they suggested if he hadn't passed out, he'd probably be dead. So if you think that wild animals don't attack, they still do in the south. So be ready for them. <laughs> We tend not to get attacked by wild animals. We tend not to uh, get chased by wild tribes. But here's a great question with this beautiful group of people. Are we under stress? Are we under threat? Do we feel like angry, annoyed, frustrated ever? Well, we have physiology on our side. If you don't need to run away from a wild animal, parent, if you don't need to... <laughs> Uh, turn and fight a wild parent, uh, create your own threat so that when that threat arrives, you're ready for it. And that's called 10 seconds of high intense activity. Now I say activity for a reason, I don't like the word exercise. Because most people I talk to when I say exercise, it's a swear word and they hate it and they never want to do it. Apparently according to the research uh, experts who, who analyse large population groups, anywhere between 40 to 50% of the population right now is actively desiring not to exercise ever. <laughs> Half of the population doesn't want to exercise ever. How do you motivate people to do that? Here's, here's what you don't do. You don't give them 45 minute classes and you don't tell them to run for five kilometres and you don't give them an exercise that makes their muscles burn and makes them feel sick. Does that make sense? When I hear, oh, the gym's got classes for 45 minutes, I go, well, there's a setup for failure. And let me tell you a gorgeous story about that. I've been managing gyms all over the world, all of my life. And there's a research study done by uh, university lecturers and professors on university teenagers, boys. And if you heard this, you should exercise for at least 20 minutes three times a week. Have you heard that? That's where that came from, 18-year-old boys. And we've extrapolated that out and said that everybody in the whole world should exercise for at least 20 minutes three times a week. Unfortunately, the world has become fatter and sicker and weaker than it's ever been. I don't know if you've noticed, but it has. So they've now suggested 150 minutes a week. How's that working for us? So I had a lady on the, on the treadmill at the gym and she came to me and she said, Oh, well, you told me that I need to do 20 minutes on the treadmill and don't bother. What a ridiculous thing to say. I'm really, I keep my blonde hair for a reason. It's grey now, but I keep it blonde to remind me not to be this stupid ever again. <laughs> she said to me, wise woman, what if there's a blackout of like 15 minutes? What if there's a blackout at 7 minutes? Does it mean that that 7 minutes doesn't count? Like is the magic turnover point 20 minutes? See, that's a critical thinking question, isn't it? Don't just listen to all the things that people say. How about ask why and how? Why is it 20 minutes and how did that come about? So I went and had a look and it came about by 18-year-old boys in university. They didn't compare them to 45-year-old women, 6-year-old women, 20... It's a ridiculous thing. And it has nothing to do with science because science is 100% effort to get 100% result. How long? 10 seconds. That's the only energy system where you can put in 100% effort. There's no waste product, so there's no burning sensation. There's no, not even sweating on a really hot day. You can go flat out for 10 seconds and you probably won't even get a sweat up. 
You know what people say to me? It can't be that it can't be true. Why? I put my hands on my hips for a reason. <laughs> Why not? What if you could get fit and strong and healthy and stay that way for the rest of your life and all you've got to put in is bursts of high intense 10 seconds? Might be one in the morning, one morning tea, one when you get a cranky child, one when you get a cranky parent, one when you get a cranky co-worker. Some of you might be doing it quite regularly throughout the day. <laughs> but every time you feel stressed, every time you feel angry, every time you feel under threat, what if you just did something for 10 seconds? Your, your brain, your heart, your lungs, your muscles, they're all blind. You know people say, you should do kettlebells, they're better than uh, dumbbells. No, dumbbells are better, you need to do barbells. And you need to do three sets of 10. Since when can muscles count and since when do they know what you're lifting? If I overcome a threat, I feel rewarded. If I overcome something that's heavy, I feel rewarded. Doesn't matter what it is. During the, I like to call it the happy home stay that we've had for the last three years. <laughs> uh, during the happy home stay in New Zealand, particularly down in the south here, there were people that were lifting cows, sheep, plows, bags of wheat. Doesn't matter what you lift, as long as you get strong muscles and bones and you get puffed, you'll get fit and strong. Does that sound exciting? And how long do you need to lift for? How long do you need to get puffed for? All right, so if we could teach this to our kids, and I just want to rattle this off because I get excited. If I'm fit and strong, what might happen to my body? What might happen to my life? Let's start on the outside. If I've got a fit, strong body, great circulation, is it possible that I'll have good hair, good skin, good nails? Is it possible that I will have uh, if I've got strong muscles and bones, I will have better posture, which also makes me look good, yeah? Uh, a lot of people walk around like this and no clothes look good on this, do they? <laughs> if I walk like this, I look better. It's a better coat hanger, yeah? Now, all clothes look good on a great coat hanger. So if you're concerned about, and I'm not sure if anybody in this room ever has been concerned about losing weight or looking good or standing in the mirror looking fantastic, I don't know that's ever been part of your life, but I have been involved in an industry where that is, seems to be the only thing that they're concerned about, ripped out goggles, tight butt cheeks. I'm not here to talk to you about that. But if you want to look good in the mirror, if you want to love what you see in the mirror, is it possible that if you have strong muscles and bones, first of all, if you've got strong muscles pulling on bones, you'll have better posture, yes? So that automatically puts you in the upright position. Muscles are the determining factor of our metabolism. Base metabolic rate, how many calories do I need to survive in a warm room in 24 hours? If I can speed that up, does it mean I could eat more or eat the same as what I am now and get some squidgy bits off my body? Just say yes, probably. So I want a faster BMR. I want more, I want that to be better. So if I've got more muscle tissue or if I'm a woman and I've lost muscle tissue because I've gotten older, you don't have to, but if you have, then I can have a resting metabolic rate that's higher, but automatically need more to survive. Does that sound good? Does anybody like food besides me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> then there's the metabolic rate, which is the number of calories that you burn throughout the day, depending on what you're doing. If you're constantly spiking your metabolism by doing 10 seconds of intense activity, not one minute of intense activity, because as soon as you go past 10 seconds, you start producing lactic acid, you get the burning sensation. It's a waste of time. You're not working 100%. Have I got that point yet? Yes. So throughout the day, you spike your metabolism 10 seconds at a time throughout the day. Your body will be constantly burning more calories at a faster rate throughout the day. Is that exciting? Mm -hmm. Then there's this thing called your RQ, your respiratory quotient. Have you heard of that? That's where the calories are coming from. So most people, and you've probably heard this, are sugar burners. The body prefers to burn sugar because it's easy. It's in the bloodstream. It's easier to burn, yeah? But when you're constantly listening, when you're constantly going into the phosphate system, and I'll just put this in a side note. Bro, do you want to burn calories when you exercise? Not really. Do you want to increase your metabolism when you exercise? Not really. Because 10 seconds doesn't do that much. Don't burn very many calories in 10 seconds, do you? Everybody up, let's do it again. Go, everybody up. <laughs> On your mark, get set, go. 10, 9, 8, faster, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 
two, one. Beautiful. <laughs> we're not doing a triathlon, we're just doing it in 10 seconds. Because we're in a hurry, you see. <laughs> Don't burn very many calories just then. And most people, when they go to the gym or do an exercise class, how many calories did I burn? I don't want to burn any. And I also don't want to burn any fat when I'm working at 100% activity. I can't, because the phosphate system doesn't use fat. It uses stored glycogen, carbohydrate, sugar. You know that poisonous thing that everybody talks about, it's your nature, but it's going to kill you? It will if you don't burn it up. <laughs> if it's floating around in your bloodstream, it's got big molecules, this big, bangs up against your arteries and causes severe damage inside your arteries. That's where type 2 diabetes comes from, cardiovascular disease. Every sickness in the world really comes down to too much sugar in your bloodstream. But guess what happens when you're really fit? You burn it up. In 10 seconds of intense activity, that's the only thing you can burn. You can't burn fat. But here's what happens. Your respiratory quotient, which is where are the calories coming from? Row, if you keep forcing us to go into this phosphate system where all we're burning is sugar, well, here's a great question. How much carbohydrate do we store in our body at any one time? Anybody know? Because it's got a bad rap, hasn't it, poor old carbs? <laughs> They're really bad for you. Do you know how much we store? Brain, liver, glycogen, half a kilo. That's all you're capable of storing. Now, will your body turn excess carbohydrate into fat? Yes, if you're unfit and if you're not burning it up. So if throughout the day you're constantly spiking your metabolism, your body says, we need to keep that stored carbohydrate which is going to make us use it all day long. So we better turn the body into a fat-burning machine which is resting. So your body prefers to burn sugar, carbohydrate, glycogen, all the same thing when you're working at 100% effort. But when you're resting, your body prefers to burn, say the word, because it's, it's got a bit of a nasty thing about it now. Say it, say it loud. Fat. <laughs> your body prefers to burn fat. And I don't know why it's got such a bad rap. It's just a macronutrient. The macronutrient of fat is made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Guess what carbohydrate's made out of? Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, CHO. Yes, it's the same thing. But if you turn your body into a machine that's really fit and prefers to burn sugar when you're exercising, you now prefer to burn fat when you are sitting. Is this exciting? Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but most humans spend a lot more time sitting and doing nothing than they do sprinting. Would that be fair? But if you inject sprinting of any kind, doesn't matter as long as you get puffed, if you inject sprinting of any kind into your day throughout the day, your body turns into a machine that burns sugar when you're exercising and fat when you're resting. Come on. That's really cool, yes? And how long is the intense activity got to go for? Yeah. Ten seconds. <laughs> I hope you're getting from me that this is not a fanatical exercise program. <laughs> It's about throughout the whole day, if you did 10 lots of 10, you'd be spiking your metabolism all the time. Now, when you spike your metabolism, you change your brain. So we're gonna sing the song now. There's five verses, you ready? The first verse is the least complicated. No, there's the second least. This is the second least complicated. Please sing with me with passion and enthusiasm and excitement. You ready? Be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy. Be happy, be happy. That's the first verse. Yes, I like that. Be happy. She's got the rhythm. What's your name? Tanya's got the rhythm. Be happy, be happy, be happy. Now, here's the challenge. I don't care how grumpy you are. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care how miserable you are, what stress you've got. When you get puffed and your brain fills up with dopamine, serotonin, brain-derived neurotropic factor, oxytocin, if you're exercising with somebody else, and endorphins, you can't be grumpy. Because they're called happy drugs for a reason. Your brain chemistry changes. <laughs> if you've got grumpy kids in your classroom, if you've got grumpy kids in your life, if you've got a grumpy husband, 10 seconds of intense activity and the brain chemistry changes from grumpy to... <laughs> you can't help it. Now, you could take drugs, you could gamble, you could smoke, you could drink, 
you could have sex, you could, that's, that's a good one, you could go shopping. They all produce dopamine and serotonin, but what are the side effects of gambling, smoking, drugs? I'm going to ask a really important question. One of the other reasons I'm in New Zealand, I took in schools all the time, I said to Wendy before, I think I've been to more schools in more countries than anybody else in the world. Because when somebody asks me, please come to our school and chat to our kids, I'm there. That's, and as I shared before, you're, you're controlling how our kids are going to grow up. That's what you do. That's why I'm here. I don't bother too much with the other adults because they can do whatever they want. But you're controlling what our kids do. Yeah? What if our kids grew up with a headspace of being fit and strong and healthy and they only had to do 10 seconds of physical activity spike throughout the day? What if in a classroom of grumpy kids, if you've ever got somebody that's angry, upset, grumpy, you just got them to sprint on the spot for 10 seconds? I'd have a punching bag, ask my husband. Martial arts for kids is phenomenal. And they can kick and punch and get rid of their aggression. And their brain then fills up with dopamine, serotonin, without all the side effects. So here's the horrible question I was going to ask you. I get invited to schools for mental health week. When you're as old as me, that's very difficult to understand. And I said to a careers officer that invited me, why am I coming? Why is there even mental health week? Ready? Because Rowie, half of our students are on antidepressants. It was a very large high school in Brisbane. Half of our students are in antidepressants. This is the horrible question I was going to ask you. If you've ever been on them, if you, if you know anyone that's on an antidepressant, if you are uh, ever asked to go on an antidepressant, please ask to see the side effects of antidepressants. There's pages and pages of them. And the number one, are you ready? This, I hope this clicks in. The number one side effect of antidepressants is suicidal tendencies. What has happened to the rate of suicide and attempted suicide in New Zealand? Can you see why I'm here today? I'm a happy, positive lady, but that stuff, that makes me angry. When you can change your brain chemistry in how long? Yes. And if I'm feeling happy, when I've changed my brain chemistry, I can't feel sad. You can only think about one thing at a time. And if you've got dopamine, serotonin, brain-derived neurotropic factor, oxytocin, endorphins, you cannot feel angry or upset. You've got happy transmitters in your brain. Happy drugs. <laughs> so what's the first verse? Be happy, be happy, be happy. Now I'm going to add something in there really important. Did I say be happy if and when? Here's what most people say. I'll be really happy when it's school holidays. I'll be really happy if I have more money. I'll be much happier if I lose weight. I'll be really happy when I get a divorce. I'll be really happy. I'm just sharing with you some of the things that people have shared with me in the last few days. I'll be really happy if and when. No, no, no. When you change your brain chemistry, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. The serotonin is a satisfaction transmitter that makes you feel good regardless of what's going on in your life. Have you ever wondered why people in third world countries with nothing? No electricity, no internet, no tablet, <laughs> and they're still really happy. What is that? How can that even be possible? If you ask our kids, they go, I can't be, how can I be happy without my social media? Because these people are outside, fresh air, sunshine, lifting heavy, getting, getting puffed, and their brains filled with serotonin, yes? Wouldn't we love that for our kids? Please say yes. <laughs> so the first verse isn't based on I'll be happy even when, it's just let's be happy, let's choose to be happy. So the song that I sang at the start has a lot of meaning to me because when you sing, I feel good, na 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 I knew that I would. Now, what are you telling your own brain? Good. Your brain will do exactly what you tell it to do. You know that, don't you? And very quickly, here's how I know, very uh, intense uh, scientific research. Google, anybody Googled recently? <laughs> That's how we got here today, Dr. Google. <laughs> Have you Googled recently? Yes. yes or no, hands up? Yeah. Okay, so we all know what it is. Larry and Sergey, who invented Google, do you know how they did that? They're very clever guys, but they didn't just go, oh, let's make a search engine. They looked at how the human brain worked. 
The human brain is exactly the same as Google. So, question. If I type in shoes into Google, will buses come up? What will come up? Because it's simply a connection between what I type in and what's on the internet. Yes, everyone will get that simple, yes? Human brain's exactly the same. Conscious brain, subconscious brain. Subconscious brain stores everything. Everything that's ever happened in your life is stored in your subconscious brain. We know this, yes? So whatever word I type into my conscious brain, now my subconscious brain, which is the internet of my own brain, searches all the files in my own brain and comes up with whatever I typed in. Now the blokes in the room might not get this. I think there's two or three. <laughs> Anybody had a fat day today, yesterday, any other day in your life? Anybody had a fat day? Hands up. Where you looked in the mirror and you went, mm, I'm fat. Yeah. Or I feel fat. <laughs> so you typed in the word, didn't you? You typed into your own brain, fat. So your subconscious brain goes, mm, I've got a few files on fat in here. <laughs> it goes back to, you might have been three years, of old, three years of age with chubby cheeks. And somebody said, oh, you've got fat chubby cheeks. And your brain will find that file and feed it into your conscious brain. You might have had a boyfriend at seven that said, you're really fat, you're really fat. And that file will come up because it searches for every fat file, yes? You had a, another person, some horrible girl like me, who said, you're a terrible person and we hate you and you're really fat when you were 13. And that file will come up. And every time you've ever told yourself that you're fat, those files will come up. And you're standing in front of the mirror, you say, I'm fat, and guess what you've got now? You now have a fat day. You have no chance of not having a fat day. Would that be fair? Yeah. Uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm swearing, we do this every day. Can't. If you type in the word can't into your brain, your brain says, correct, you're exactly right, you can't. Here's all the files that say can't. Every single time in your life that you've been told that you can't, somebody has told you that you can't, you believe that you can't, you now can't, so you definitely can't. It's a terrible word, I hate it, it should be just banned. What if you type into your brain, how can I? See, the human brain likes a challenge. I can't afford it. Have you ever said that? I really like to buy those shoes, can't afford them. Really like a new house, can't afford it. Really like to buy a new car, can't afford it. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. You can't. If you say that, you can't. Have you ever tried on something, shoes, handbag, dress, something? I want this. <laughs> and you found a way. Yes or no? Because you've told your brain, I want this, how can I have it? And you've stopped drinking coffee for a week, or you've given up on your wine, or you've stopped this, but you've done something to achieve it, yes or no? So all I'm asking is this, when you wake up in the morning, type in the right words. If you type in, I'm fat, I'm depressed, I'm sick, I'm tired, there's a good one. You wake up, I'm tired, I'm so tired. And your brain says, yes, you are. And here's all the reasons why. You didn't get enough sleep. You've been stressed all your life. You should have slept three weeks ago. You missed a night's sleep. And you just feel now tired. tired, tired, tired. If you didn't know how tired you were, how tired would you be? So you just tell yourself, I feel good. No, 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 no. I knew that I would now. It's called telling the truth in advance. I don't like to say lie. It's just tell the truth in advance. Because if you then get out of bed and say, I feel good, no, 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 and you do this, I feel good, no, 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 I knew that I would now. Just, just a personal thing, this is very personal. From the age, as I shared, of 10 to 13, I did stupid exercises on the floor that wasted my time and wrecked my joints. And I'm sharing this with you very passionately. If you do this on the floor over and over and over, I think we're unbending here. I'm bending at L4, L5, so I'm doing this with my spine, yeah? <clears throat> but I was really aggressive with my exercise. I used to do so up and twist, and up and twist fast, and then with a ball or a weight, up and twist. So I was putting compression forces, sorry, traction, I want traction forces and compression forces. I was putting shearing forces across my spine, with a twist with momentum. At 18 years of age, I had a 
perforated disc and I was taken in an ambulance in this position, I couldn't move. I was told that I would never be able to run again and I would never be able to lift anything heavy again because I had wrecked my back. I love it when people tell me stuff like that. Because <laughs> that's not true, just get a second opinion. Everything that's ever been achieved by anybody, they were told they can't. There are people that, and I have to tell you another quick side, side story. I was talking to a neurosurgeon who was speaking in a national, international conference in Melbourne. And the reason I picked him up, he had beautiful shoes on at the airport. And I said, mate, you've got nice shoes. And he said, when you're speaking at an international neurosurgeon's conference, you better wear nice shoes. I said, so tell me about that. What are you talking about? And he said, I can't really explain to you what I'm talking about because even the neurosurgeons won't believe me, they're going to call me a lunatic. I said, okay, I'm up for lunacy, I like it. He said, as neurosurgeons, we have to stop telling people that they're never going to walk again. Because he said, too many of my clients, or I've said, you're never going to walk again, have walked out of the hospital, or six months later, they've walked back into the hospital. Because when you tell your brain you can't walk again, guess what? Especially if a neurosurgeon tells you. You believe it. How many people do you know? You're going to die in six months, six weeks, 12 weeks. You've got cancer. Horrible, horrible disease. But when you're really fit and strong, can you fight diseases like that? Please say yes. And so too many people in my life have been told, you've got six months to live, and 60 years later, they're still living. Buy into that. What if we teach our kids that? Isn't that called resilience? Isn't that called critical thinking, isn't that called don't listen to what the crowd's saying and think for yourself? If somebody says you can't, why would you believe it? So when you wake up in the morning, if you tell yourself you're going to have a shit day, you will, yes or no? And I'm not going to excuse my language, because I want you to remember it, that woman with the blonde hair, she swore at us. If you wake up in the morning and you say, I feel good, no, 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 I need that, I would now. So when I get up in the morning and ask my husband, it's hilarious because of my back and the stupid exercises that I've ever done in my life. When I get out of bed, I actually can't do that. My body's completely busted. Every joint in my body is broken. I'm doing stupid exercises. But I wake up with, I feel good. I knew that I would now. I get onto my cross trainer. And there's a reason for the cross trainer because there's no pounding. And I can go absolutely flat out without even warming up. Because when the wild animal's chasing you, it doesn't give you a chance to warm up, does it? Excuse me, I just have to do my stretches. And then you can chase me. <laughs> when you go into the fight and flight system, your body produces those chemicals immediately. Epinephrine, and adrenaline, and cortisol. Well, cortisol is an anti-inflammatory. So I get on the cross trainer and go flat out as fast as I possibly can. It looks ridiculous because I'm going as hard as I can. So I get out of bed like this, can't move, literally. And everything hurts. And I stumble over to the cross trainer. Get onto the cross trainer. Ten seconds. Get off the cross trainer and look at me now. When I got up this morning, I was like this. And when I walk in here today, what am I doing? <laughs> That's called positive attitude. I can do it. And I'm getting strong. And I'm going to push circulation, blood flow, nutrients, and positive attitude through my body. Now, I don't have a unique physiology. You can do exactly the same thing. Yes or no? More importantly, you can do whatever your bloody well want because you're an adult, but what about our kids? Our grumpy kids, our sad kids, our depressed kids, our anxious kids, our kids that have horrible, horrible lives. I was in a school in Townsville, and a teenage boy, and I was telling Wendy about my coat. Every time I go to school, I always wear my coat because kids, I know you're not supposed to, you know, they're kissing and cuddling and kids and stuff, you're not supposed to touch kids touch me because they want to feel my coat. And this teenage boy was completely disconnected throughout the whole day. We were there for the whole day. He just had his hoodie on and his earphones. He didn't talk to anybody the whole day. At the end of the day, I had a lot of students waiting to talk to me. He waited right till the end. He came up to me and I he rubbed my coat and I gave him a hug and he didn't let go. When I talked in that go, teenage boys are pretty strong, but he just swore was sport I said, sweetheart, what's going on? He said, I don't want to go home. He said, this is going to be the best day of my life I've ever 
experience so much positivity in your life. So tell me about that. So my father's a drug dealer and he prostitutes my mother. So when I go home, they leave a shoe on the doorstep and if the shoe's outside, I'm not allowed to go inside. We were in a, uh, an AFL big stadium in, in uh, Townsville and there was a gym. So I took him down to the gym and punched the bag. Really, he really had to punch the bag really hard. And he left that environment with a huge big smile on his face and had me drugs pumping through his brain. I said, sweetheart, any time you ever feel like the way you felt today, when you hug me, I want you to punch the bag, run up some stairs, sprint on the spot, do some push-ups, do some jump squats, whatever it is. I want your brain to be happy. It doesn't matter what's going on out there. Nobody can get inside your brain. You have full control over what goes on inside your brain. That's how we make kids to deal with stress. I don't want them to get on the internet and abuse people. I was part of that. Those girls just didn't have the internet to abuse me. But can you imagine? I came away from that a stronger person. A lot of people, if they were given 450 pieces of paper to say, we don't like you, there's a whole heap of horrible things that could have happened there, yeah? And I, don't want, I want our kids to be tough and resilient. And what are we doing to teach them that? If they're not fit and they're not strong, they're not going to be mentally tough and strong. You can only change your brain when you're physically tough and strong. Does that make sense? Please say yes. yes. <laughs> all right, so what's verse one? There's only five verses and I'll hurry up now. What's verse one? Be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy. Okay, verse two, you ready? <laughs> Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Go. Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. How's it go? Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Now I don't actually care if it's water. Because your brain doesn't know. But your brain's 80 to 90% fluid, yeah? So if you are dehydrated, how do you feel? Just ask elite athletes. My husband often has to make weight, which is predominantly, when you stand on the scales, you don't know what that weight is. And when you lose a lot of water, you lose a lot of, lose a lot of weight, yes? So if I lose a lot of weight from water, my brain doesn't work. You know how sometimes we say, take two Panadol in a glass of water? About two glasses of water. <laughs> and just feel what happens to your body. But the challenge is, and here's the ridiculousness of my industry, I can't call it a profession, and the silly things that we listen to. How many of you have heard you should drink eight glasses of water every day or drink two litres of water every day? Who's heard that? No. It's pretty normal, isn't it? First of all, haven't you ever asked, what size glasses? <laughs> what if I do this size? <laughs> what if I do this size? How about what if I'm set six foot tall versus five foot tall versus four foot tall? What if I'm a big person? What if I'm a little person? What if I use my brain all day, which requires a lot of fluid? What if I live in a really hot part of the world and I'm sweating all day? What if I, I just sweat a lot? Wouldn't I need more? But what's the standard response? No, you've got to drink eight glasses or two litres. What a ridiculous statement. Please think about some of the ridiculous things you've heard exercise people say to you. It's stupid. <laughs> How do you know that you're hydrated? Go to the toilet, <laughs> have a tinkle and have a look. If you do a big long one, and you, ladies, we can just listen. Blokes can actually have a look, and they probably won't because they don't do that. But if you're if you're next to your girlfriend in the bathroom and she just goes, and the little tickle comes out, you need to come out and say, sweetheart, we need to have a chat. <laughs> we need long wings, long ones. And what colour? Clear. Because the more clear, the more hydrated. Now, some people say to me, but if I take a vitamin pill or whatever, it's yellow in the morning. Yeah, but by the end of the day, it should be clear. And the beautiful thing is, the more hydrated you are, the more your body holds on to the fluid that you've got, you just tinkle. Because people say, if I drink all the time, I'll be going in the bathroom all the time. No, you can just do a big one in the morning and the big one at night, and it'll be clear and won't be yellow, and life will be awesome. So, how's it go? Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. Drink more water till you've got clear wheeze. See how kids love this? You might be embarrassed to see this. The kids often look at me and then they look at their teacher and they go, can I see that, miss? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's my favourite story when you said this. I was in a supermarket on the Gold Coast doing my shopping. 
you can see it in the supermarket, can't you? <laughs> and this guy comes up to me and he says, I've got long clearways because of you. <laughs> this is a complete stranger. I don't know who this is. <laughs> this is a very unusual way to start a conversation, wouldn't one not think? I said, that's awesome, tell me about that. <laughs> this is my favourite leadership story of all time and again, why I'm here. He says, you came to my son's school. My son comes home from school, he says, Dad, you've got to have long clear weeds. Rowie said, we need a gold star chart. I'm encouraging you to have a gold star chart. Everybody at your kindergarten and everybody in your home, their name goes on this gold star chart, and every time you have a long clear weed, you get a gold star. <laughs> in the supermarket, he goes like this, I'm winning! <laughs> he said, something as simple as a long clear weed. Every time I have one, I get a gold star. So if I have a yellow ticket, I just go and have something to drink. He said, I'm a better dad, I'm a better husband, I'm a better lover, I'm a better coach, I'm a better accountant, because that's what he did. I just, my life is better. Something as simple as be hydrated. So what's verse two? Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. You see my kids love this? And they sing it loudly. All right, first verse, be happy, be happy, be happy, and drink more water till you've got clear weeds, drink more water till you've got clear weeds, drink more water till you've got clear weeds, easy. Number three, you know this already? You're going to be thinking, well, we, did, we expected some pill pad or potion or miracle cure for being healthy. You ready for number three? Eat more real food, eat more real food, eat more real food, eat more real food. Get excited. Eat more real food, eat more real food, eat more real food. It doesn't matter who I ask, 5, 15, 25, 55, 105. If you were your own high performance eating coach, what would you advise yourself to eat? Nobody has ever said to me, I think I should eat takeaway food every meal. Lolly's chocolate cake and biscuits, I can drink copious amounts of alcohol and everything that comes in a packet in a bag. Nobody has ever said that to me. <laughs> Here's what's screwed up though. I went to a medical conference where they asked me to come and talk. It was called the Di International Diabetes Conference. So it was the experts in the world on type 2 diabetes and obesity. Then now that word never existed, it does now, it's in the dictionary. Because when you become overweight, it's very likely that you'll get type 2 diabetes. The brief from the conference organiser was this, Rowie, can you please come to this conference, speak to these medical professionals, doctors, oncologists, cardiologists, all these people. Uh, they've been arguing for three days. All we hear in that room is yelling and screaming and arguing. Can you please come to the room, talk to these people about how to get their patients fit and strong, but don't give them anything that they can argue about because we're sick of arguing. So do the dancey thing and get people laughing, but no arguing. The urologists, they loved. Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Drink. They loved it. They clapped and cheered. They thought that was awesome. What I learned that day, though, is that there is a very distinct argument between carnivores and vegan vegetarians. Did you know that? How do you know somebody's a vegan vegetarian? Don't worry, they will tell you. How do you know somebody's a carnivore? Don't worry, they will tell you. Well, when you've got oncologists and cardiologists arguing about, can, can there be anything more extreme than eat only plants, eat only animals? Can there be anything more apart than that? But I had to talk to them about don't argue, and you have to talk about food, don't you? Because it's the fuel so that you can sprint on the spot. It's the fuel so that you can lift heavy things. It's the fuel to live, yeah? So you have to talk about it. Eat more real food, eat more real food, eat more real food. Because the vegan vegetarians talk about organic food, they talk about fresh food, they talk about full quality food, yes or no? The carnivores don't talk about eating sausages or deli meat or uh, meatballs in a can, the, car the carnivals all talk about lean, clean, organic meat. So here I was in front of all these top medical e experts in the world and they all agreed that we should eat more real food. Here's the question, probably what should I eat? What do you like to eat is my first question. Because if somebody tells you that you can't have, mustn't have, don't have, shouldn't have, I mean, you, got, you guys all deal with future adults in the world, yes? <laughs> if you tell the child they can't have, what happens now? 
We haven't grown out of that. If you're on a diet that says you can't have, mustn't have, don't have, shouldn't have, what do you want? I had a lady who said to me once, so I was a personal exercise coach for many years, one-on-one -on -one helping people to be healthy, fit, strong. And she was told by an expert that she couldn't eat bread anymore. Can't have bread, it's bad for you. Don't eat bread. She said, two challenges with that. They never even asked me if I like bread. And I don't. I've never eaten bread. I don't like it. But now that they've told me I can't have it, every time I go past a bakery, even in the supermarket, I look at the bread now and I want it. Because your brain doesn't hear can't, don't, won't. What does it hear? Bread, bread, bread. So the really important thing about food is that you eat what you love. Would that be fair? And if you turn your body into a fat burning, calorie burning, food burning, sugar burning, everything burning machine, it's never going to get a chance to end up on your body because you're going to burn it up. Isn't that exciting? So when people say, what should I eat? I just say, eat whatever you bloody well want. Because when you've got a great endocrine system, hormonal system, and we're predominantly females, has anybody ever complained about their hormones? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> when I was a teenager, they told me I'd have a horrible period. I never, haven't had any children, so I don't know about pregnancies, but I've trained hundreds of women through pregnancies. And menopause scared me a bit because the horrible stuff I heard about menopause, you're going to get fat and you're going to get hot flushes and you're going to get headaches and you're going to feel like shit. I said to my husband, I think I've been through menopause. I haven't had a period for about a year now. I think I've been through menopause. <laughs> See, when you're really fit and strong, your endocrine system works really well. Make sense? Here's what happens when you've got a strong, healthy endocrine hormonal system. Your hormonal system is designed to bring your body back to homeostasis healthy. That's what your endocrine system is meant to do. So it tells you when you're hungry. If you're hungry, what should you do? You should bloody eat. This thing of you should starve yourself. No, don't starve yourself. That's what your endocrine system is designed to do. If you need food, eat food. Guess what else it tells you though? You're full. Stop eating food. <laughs> but if it's broken or busted, if you're not healthy, fit and strong, your endocrine system doesn't work either. So it doesn't tell you when you're hungry and it doesn't tell you when you're full. So you just keep eating for emotional reasons. You eat because you're angry, you eat because you're happy. You eat because you've had a bad day, you eat because you've had a good day. That's an endocrine system that's not working properly. When it works properly, I love Italian gelati, my favourite food. Does anybody else like Italian gelati? How about chocolate? I love chocolate too. How about hot chips and gravy? Anybody like that? Chocolate mud cake, cheese. Anybody join in any time? You like your favourite food. <laughs> when I'm full, you can put my favourite food in front of me, and I don't want it. I'm full. We have a joke in our house because sometimes we have Easter eggs from last year still in the cupboard. <laughs> Because I don't eat them unless I feel like it. So here's what I wish for everybody in their food. If when you're hungry, stop eating when you're full and eat whatever you bloody well want. But I reckon that you're really smart and you know that if you just eat chocolate and lollies and cake and take away food and soft drink, that you probably won't feel that good. And your body will tell you that, won't it? People say, I love Kentucky Fried Chicken. If you eat a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, how's it going to make you? See, this is the thing here. It's not how. It's not that. It's not the food that's the challenge. Because all food, you ready? We know this from science. All food is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. All food. That's all it's made out of. And the only one that's got nitrogen is protein. Carbon and, and uh, sorry, fat and protein. Let's start again. Fat and carbohydrate are made of the same thing. Fat just has more calories. Got double bond in the molecule. The joins them together. Isn't that quick for science? Same thing. So which part of carbohydrate is bad, which part of protein is bad? They're the macronutrients. They're all just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. I don't want to sound boring, but this is how boring it really is. None of those are bad, are they? A better question. If you have no food, you haven't eaten for two weeks because you're out in the desert, because you can live two, three weeks without food, and there's a bag of sugar in front of you. You know how they say sugar will kill you, it's bad for you? If you haven't eaten for two weeks, there's a bag of sugar in front of you, and you eat it, what will happen? You'll live. Yeah. That sugar has now become a superfood. Different question. When you're in hospital on a drip, what's in the drip? It's not a fat drip. Some people wish it was an alcohol drip. <laughs> it's not a protein drip. What is it? It's a glucose drip. Yeah, because that's what the brain runs on. We get caught up in bad food, bad food, bad food, bad food. No, no. There's no bad food. The funniest story ever. 
one of my students from my college, he decided to take us on board bad food, good food. He said, what's the ultimate superfood? Looked it up, uh, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, that's the ultimate superfood. So he ate three kilograms of Brussels sprouts at once. <laughs> so if you eat three kilograms of chocolate at once, you'll feel sick, yeah? You eat a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, you'll feel sick. Three kilograms of Brussels sprouts, broccoli, he said I had the worst tummy cramps, stomach cramps. I passed the stickiest wind for about three days and I felt like crap. Well, we call it superfood, don't we? All I'm asking is please, if you tell your if you tell our kids that's a bad food, how far do we go from bad food to bad person? Here's how I know this. Most of my group, half I've worked for people who are anorexic bulimic. Exercise anorexics are more than obese. The headspace is exactly the same as foods controlling your life. And guess where it all started? Can't have, mustn't have, don't have, shouldn't have. It's bad for you. So if I eat it now, I feel guilty. And one of two things happens. I either don't have it at all, but I'm really angry because I can't have it. Or I binge on it at some stage, which is not good either, is it? I don't want our kids to grow up anorexic, bulimic, exercise bulimic, or morbidly obese. None of those headspaces are healthy. Could you help me, please? So, what do we want our kids to do? Eat more real food, eat more real food, eat more real food! Woohoo! <laughs> Pretty easy. Okay, two more verses. We've done this one already, so it's going to be very quick. <sighs> See, that's the easiest verse because there's no words. And if we do this really loudly together, everybody out there will want to come in here. Ready? Go. <laughs> it's the fourth verse, and there's four paths for a reason. What if in your classroom, what if in your, your kindergarten, what if in your life, you got four puffs an hour? Easy to remember. You put it on your timer. Every 15 minutes, 10 seconds, everybody up. Come on, let's go, go. We'll do the entire, we've got time now, we'll do the entire drive along. On your mark, get set, go. 10, 9, harder, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, shake it off. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here's what happened. Some of you paced yourself that time because you knew we were doing three. The longer you go, the less effort you put in. If you just get people up every 15 minutes and get them puffed for 10, not 15 seconds, not 20 seconds, because that's like to guess it. 10 seconds, your brain chemistry changes. And you want to be puffing. Fit people puff, unfit people puff. The only difference is the speed in between that you recover. And that's how you tell if you're getting fitter. Some people might get puffed and not be able to go again for another three hours. But as soon as you get your breath back, go again. But what if our kids, we get them to brush their teeth, yes? I'll rephrase. People say to me, I've got no time to exercise. I'm too busy. I'm on holidays. I'm not bothered. What about this? Do you still brush your teeth when you're on holidays? <laughs> Do you still have a shower when you're busy? <laughs> Do you still eat food? Do you still wear clothes? So I'm too busy to wear clothes today. <laughs> we teach our kids to use a knife and fork. We teach them to tie their shoelaces. We teach them to eat food. We teach them to breathe effectively. We teach them to put, how to put a zipper up. What if they learned from that, that age, four puffs an hour? Would we have different brain chemistry? Last but not least. How many of you in your life have had a challenge, one small challenge, a problem, something that's caused you a challenge? Mm -hmm. One? How about how many of you have had more than one? So two? Mm -hmm. Both hands. <laughs> how about three? One leg. <laughs> how about how many of you have had multiple challenges in your life? Just do a little pop to share. <laughs> how boring would life be if we didn't have any challenges? Better question. How would we get stronger, tougher, wiser if we were never put under pressure? How could we become a diamond if we never had a hassle or a challenge? You can say to me, I want every day to be easy. I think you get bored. <laughs> when you overcome a challenge, how do you feel? 
fit, strong bodies overcome challenges so much easier. I'm going to use the ultimate yuck, the ultimate stress, the ultimate horrible thing, and I touched on it before. Cancer's probably touched everybody in our lives, if not you personally, somebody that you know, or somebody that they know. Yes or no? My husband has a master's degree in exercise science, and one of the people that he studied with, Professor Robert Newton, you can find him on YouTube, he's done a sensational lecture called Exercise is Medicine, Medicine is Exercise. That's the, it's easy to remember, find it. It's all the technical stuff that I've been talking about today. His father died of cancer, and he watched his father literally rot away, waste away, with horrible quality of life. So we went from being an exercise physiologist that helped elite athletes get faster to trying to figure out this cancer thing. The number one thing for cancer when you talk to a top level oncologist is be really fit and be really strong and you won't get 80% of cancers. Because the cancer attacks weak bodies, yes? If you're really unlucky and you get that 20% of cancer that you have absolutely no control over, where our kids get it or you're born with it or some horrible thing happens. The very first thing they're recommending now when you get cancer diagnosis is to get to the gym. He's done this so incredibly that he's built a gym next to the oncology department. So you don't have to drive anywhere. Because fit, and I'll rephrase, your immune system is built inside your bones. And strong muscles pull on strong bones to create a strong immune system and a strong brain that you can fight horrible things that happen to you. I'm, I'm here today to, to give you every positive thing I possibly can, but life's going to throw shit yes or no. And do we need to be ready for it? Yes. And if you're mentally weak, mentally frail, and I don't think you've got an option. I hope you don't think you've got an option. You deal with children. Our kids have to have, they have to be surrounded by strong adults because otherwise they'll grow up as weak children, yes or no. When you're really fit and really strong, your kids will watch what you do. So Rob's built, we call him Isaac, he's Newton. He's built <laughs> gyms next to oncology wards so that you get a diagnosis and you go straight in there. And it's not even puffy puffy, it's heavy strength training. Heavy strength training. Now remember I said before, your muscles and bones, they don't know what you're lifting. I hate going to the gym. I bloody hate it. There's weird people in there. <laughs> strings in there. Oh no, they have strings in there. Well, they said they have like buttons in their ears and they don't talk to anybody and they do weird shit in there. <laughs> I like lifting heavy though because I want to stay strong for the rest of my life. So I lift rocks, logs, wheelbarrows full of sand, wheelbarrows full of gravel, my puppy dogs. I lift heavy things because I want to be strong. How about you? I just, you don't, have to, I don't even answer the lift things. Do you want to be strong? Yes. Do you want to have a fast metabolism? Mm -hmm. So you burn up everything you put into your body. Do you want to have a strong brain? Yes. If you think you can't lift it and you do, how do you feel? Mm. I can't lift that log, it's too heavy. Well, then you won't be able to. How, what do you say to yourself? Mm, that looks like a heavy log, let's give it a crack. <laughs> and you lift it. The, the power of endorphins will allow you to lift it. And then you feel fantastic. And I'll, I'll, if you don't believe me, here's a really negative thing to think about. If something happens to somebody that you love today, a tree falls on them, a car falls on them, they've got something heavy on them, guess what you'll be able to do? You'll lift it. The human body is capable of amazing things. We just have to allow it to do it. So from a strength, I'm not going to talk about weight lifting, I'm just talking about getting strong. Muscles and bones are blind, they can't count, you just got to overload them. So, let's say on the ground I have a log, I have a rock, and it looks heavy. You know what people say to me? When you do squats, you've heard that exercise, squats or lunges or deadlifts, I call them alive lifts, because when you pick something up off the ground, you get really strong, you're gonna stay alive for a lot longer. But if like, there's something on the ground, I go to pick it up. Yes, I have to use my ass, I have to use my hamstrings, my quads, my calves, my toes if it's heavy, everything in my legs is gonna be working. But here's a really cool thing. What am I going to lift it off the ground with? I'm going to use my arms as well, aren't I? My fingers, my forearms, my biceps, my upper arm, my triceps, my shoulders. To stop me from falling forward, the thing that has to work the hardest is my abdominals. Remember I told you why I hurt my back? 
stupid, stupid sit-ups. They have the most ridiculous exercise on the planet. They don't burn fat. All you're lifting is your head off the ground. And if you can't lift your own head, you really need to do some strength training. <laughs> that burning sensation you're feeling is not exploding fat cells. That is lactic acid pushing up against nerve endings, yes? But if I pick up something heavy off the ground, the reason I don't fall over is that my abdominals have to hold me upright, yes? So I lift something really heavy. Why is it that a woman with a perforated disc, if you look at my x-rays today, it looks like I've had a fusion of L4-5. I have no disc. I've never had an operation. I've just gotten really strong abdominals, really strong lower back muscles, really strong every muscle by lifting something up off the ground and putting it back down again. One exercise. Now the only three movement patterns in the body is to push, that's what we're designed to do, push something, pull something, and pick something up off the ground. All the other silly twisty things just put shearing forces across your joints. I don't know why they, why they even exist. I'm sharing this with you because if you love to exercise and love going to the gym for hours and hours, you're an adult, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> but I don't want our kids to think that to be strong and be fit, they've got to go to the gym for hours and hours. What if they can't afford it? What if like 50% of the people in the world they don't like it? We can't afford our kids to be weak because they don't want to go to the gym. What if we got our kids, what if we lined up in the playground, some rocks that were of reasonable weight for a child to be able to pick it up off the floor and put it back down again? Here's my challenge. Most of the exercises that you see in the gym, personal training studios and boot camps, if you put that same movement pattern in a workplace, in a, on a construction site, in a, a, a factory, it would be against workplace health and safety rules. If you pick something up and put it above your head in, in an office, you get in trouble for getting people to do that. If you get people to pick something up and twist it, you get people to pick something up and throw it. <laughs> Imagine this, John, pass me the bar box, sure. sure. That workplace health and safety officer will get sued. But in the gym, they're everywhere, those exercises. I'm asking, please don't get involved in that rubbish. Please think about push, pull, pick something up off the ground, and when you pick something off the ground, you'll get strong. Just make sure it's heavy enough to do in the phosphate system, which is how long? So if you keep going, you can't do any more. There's no reps and sets. You just pick it up as many times as you can. If it's more than 10 seconds, the weight's too light. You're too <laughs> bloody strong. Isn't that awesome? Everybody stand up. We're going to wrap that right up. And then we're going home. How good's that? Are we going home with you? Here we are. We just got you two pieces of the before you go home. All right. So we're going to sing each verse three times. And I'm going to give you my favourite song that I'm hoping to give to the whole wide world. And you're going to change that. We change the world. So three times each. Ready? Be happy. Be happy. Be happy. And drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Drink more water till you've got clear weeds. Eat more real food. Eat more real food. Eat more real food. And be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Can you see why kids love this? They love it. Now, before we sit down and before we go, one of the challenges that we've all got in the world, particularly next three days' time, I don't I even say the word because I don't say it anymore. There's this day that starts the week, yeah? And people suffer from Mondayitis. <laughs> So what I've done is I've changed the names of the days of the week. <laughs> and I don't even, I can't even say that word anymore. Ask Wendy. It, this, it doesn't appear in my vocabulary because it goes like this. I'll sing it and you can join in when you're ready. <laughs> may your Mondays be magical. May your Tuesdays be terrific. May your Wednesdays be very well. May your Thursdays be thankful. May your Fridays be a fun day. May your Saturdays be super with 17 hours. May your Sundays be sparkly because you choose them to be. So it's magical day, terrific day, wow day, thankful day, fun day, super day with 17 O's and sparkle day. <laughs> if people suffer from Monday-itis, if it's called magical day-itis, because itis means inflammation of, yes? Inflammation of the magical. <laughs> then it's awesome. So just join in when you're ready. Please sing loudly if you love to sing. And I don't care if you can't sing. There's plenty of rock stars that can't sing. And we still go to their concerts. <laughs> yes, I know. Beautiful. May your Mondays be magical. May your Tuesdays be terrific. May your Wednesdays be very well. And your Thursdays be thankful. May your Fridays be a fun day. May your Saturdays be super. May your 
some days be sparkly because you choose them to be. The last line is the most important. People can, cr can try and screw up your day, but it will only be screwed up if you let them. Please don't let them and thank you for having me today.